At this point, our Nugget series takes a bit of a turn. We've covered the basics of Scrum. Now we're going to focus for the remaining Nuggets in this series literally on making Scrum work in your organization. And the key to doing that is understanding the business structure. How is the business structured? Do they want Scrum? Or probably a more appropriate statement, is the business Scrum ready? I've worked with a lot of organizations that think they're ready for Scrum, but the business themselves are not ready for Scrum. They're not ready to have dedicated product owners. They're not ready for the, as much as Scrum gives us this perfect world where we can be flexible and adaptable. I've worked with many organizations where they think they want to be flexible and adaptable, but they're actually monolithic and not ready to work with Scrum. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about understanding the business structure. A key aspect is how to work with SMEs. SMEs are an interesting aspect of being Scrum because the SMEs are not part of our project as we've discussed, but the SMEs are critical. We'll talk about the role the Scrum Master has to play in removing the roadblocks, where most of the roadblocks are non-project roadblocks. A lot of the roadblocks are going to come from understanding the business structure and determining if the business, in fact, is Scrum ready. And believe it or not, and you probably do believe it, a lot of our issues with being Scrum is going to come from traditional IT. The existing project managers, the DBAs, the architects, the business analysts who just say, where do I fit? So we'll talk a little bit about how Scrum is going to work within the traditional IT organization. And we'll talk about those projects and those parts of the business that are just not Scrum ready. Maybe overall, the business is Scrum ready, but there's areas that are not Scrum ready. And finally, I believe probably the biggest issue we have with rolling out Scrum in an organization is the negativity, the resistance that we're going to get from the audit department, from the compliance and certification departments. We're CMMI, we're ISO, we're ITIL certified. Will this Scrum thing still allow us to be, to maintain our certifications? And the first key step is understanding the business structure. Understanding who the supporters are, identify them, keep them close, keep them up to date. As we introduce Scrum into an organization, and we'll have another nugget focused on making our organization Scrum ready, we need to understand who the supporters are, and we equally need to understand who the opponents are, and try to convert. And I will stress, try to convert. We will not be able to, in my humble opinion, be able to convert all of the opponents. But if we can start to turn them around, start to get them more flexible and understanding of and accepting of, even if we never get them to fully support Scrum, we can move Scrum implementations in our organization a lot more forward. And of course, between the supporters and the opponents are the neutrals. And our job is obviously to move the neutrals towards the supporters and to prevent them from becoming opponents. I believe key is find a senior champion. Find someone in the organization with enough power and authority, and whether that's direct organizational structure, power and authority, or whether that's simply he or she is the wise old person, or maybe the wise young person in our organization, but find a senior champion who is going to support, endorse, and ensure that the organization moves forward with being Scrum ready. Expect to give lots of tours. You're going to have a lot of sightseers. Think of yourself as a tourist attraction. The supporters, the neutrals, and even the opponents are going to come down. The supporters and the neutrals are going to come down to your workspace and say, what's going on? What is all the stuff? What is all that paper all over the walls? And be very interested in hearing about it. 
And the opponents are going to come down and going to scoff at, oh, look at that. They're so, oh, this is just, they can't even get a decent piece of software that's going to support the Scrum thing. All they can do is put a bunch of scribblings and a bunch of stupid pieces of paper on the wall. You know, so again, expect to give lots of tours. Expect to educate everybody in the business and absolutely, especially from the opponents, but even from the supporters and the neutrals, expect lots of criticism because they're simply not going to understand. People are going to say, we're in the modern age. IT is everywhere. We're using smartphones. We're using tablets. IT communications, electronic processes are everywhere. And here are these scrum people sticking paper on the wall. They're just... I don't understand how the scrum thing can be so state of the art and still so traditional in focus. So understand the business structure and take the steps to move the business forward that they're going to support scrum. And the second step of understanding the business structure, more project scrum focused, is all really based on the product owner. In order for Scrum to work effectively, we absolutely need to know who, what, and how our product owner is going to work in the organization. And as you'll see, I have laid out a number of different scenarios for dealing with, supporting, understanding the product owner. And when I say one type of product owner where the product owner knows all, I don't mean this is a negative. This isn't that know-it-all in grade school who has their hand up every time the teacher asks a question and simply wants to become the teacher's pet. When I say product owner knows all, this is very much a good thing. This is a product owner who has enough knowledge, enough depth, enough full understanding of the product vision that they themselves can answer all the questions. And having that product owner who knows all absolutely simplifies the process for working with the business because we have that single point of contact. And although the product owner is always our single point of contact, the more traditional approach is what lays below the utopia where the product owner knows all where we will begin to work as a team with a number of SMEs. And I think the more traditional approach in a Scrum world is where we have our identified product owner. Obviously, it's the key person in the entire Scrum world. And we have known identified SMEs. And more times than not, the SMEs have known areas of expertise. So often when you have a good working relationship with your product owner and the team has a question about story number 43 and we know story number 43 is related to warehousing, oh, that's Betty. We'll go directly to the warehouse SME and get the questions recognizing that the product owner has already endorsed the team going forward and working with the appropriate SME. So again, Utopia is up here. But having a product owner and identified SMEs where the team can go directly to the SME or at least a quick notify. Dear product owner, working on story 43, I'm off to see Betty. Any concerns? Thanks. Good. I'm off. Probably the next common approach is where we have unknown SMEs. The product owner is going to take story 43, have a look at story 43 and say, yep. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that. Give me 15 minutes. Let me make some phone calls and I'll find out who the SME is going to be. Not bad. That can work very nicely. Takes a little more time. Needs a much, much more engaged PO because that PO has to be available to help the team find every SME. And the biggest issue with these unknown SMEs is how scrum literate are they if we take story 43 to an unknown SME who doesn't fully understand scrum are they going to be happy with a 10-minute conversation or are they going to want to have a two-hour in-depth 
requirements definition session where they're not only going to discuss the fine details of story 43, they're going to want to define the requirements for everything and anything that they've ever envisioned was going to be automated. So a small issue with dealing with these unknown SMEs only if or specifically if they're not very scrum literate and therefore not fully aware of our need to have these brief 10 minute conversations. But in reality, we can effectively create structures that's going to work with either of these processes. The next two, I believe, are problems, but often occur. You're going to have many SMEs, or hopefully not, but there will be times when the team themselves are going to violate the golden rule of Scrum, and the golden rule of Scrum is the product owner is king or queen, but you're going to have SMEs, and again, hopefully we as Scrum Masters can prevent our team from violating that golden rule, but we're going to have instances where we're bypassing the product owner. As I said, if we have identified SMEs, the team at least needs to have the courtesy of telling, dear product owner, I'm off to see Betty for story 43. When we start bypassing the product owner, when we start changing stories, when we start slipping things in, etc, etc, etc. And we've discussed enough about how the product owner owns the stories, how the product owner owns the sprint backlog, and how the product owner owns the product backlog. I don't think I need to spend more time detailing how SMEs or team bypassing the product owner can absolutely be an issue in our overall business structure, and how as Scrum Masters, we need to ensure, prevent this happening. And the last one I said is a problem. Could be a problem, could be a benefit. The way I've specifically worded it, you could say, well, Steve, how's that a problem? You have an engaged business owner running stakeholder interference. Sounds like a good thing. You've got a, a senior manager who's committed to the project, who's committed to making things work, and is out there helping us. Yes, but the product owner does not own the backlog. The product owner does not own the stories. The product, oh, sorry, I kept saying product owner. The business owner does not own the stories. The business owner does not own the backlog. That's the product owner. So sometimes having a too engaged business owner, again, is literally the same as the above. We're circumventing, we're bypassing the product owner. So yes, absolutely. I'm ecstatic when I have an engaged business owner but I want a business owner who's engaged and working within the rules of Scrum. And if I have an engaged business owner helping me manage the stakeholders, helping me, the Scrum master and the product owner, keep the stakeholder interference minimal, absolutely, that's a good thing. And I'll give that a smiley face. But sometimes, as I said again, the engaged business owner says, I don't care about that product owner he or she reports to me, this product is for me, so therefore I'm going to go out there and I'm going to define the processes. So in that case, my happy face is going to turn to a smile, and it all goes back to what we said in the earlier, engage and educate. And if we can get engaged business owners who are educated, great. And following directly on that is how to work with the SMEs. I think we've covered this already. Engaging the SMEs, we should not go to the SMEs without the product owner's knowledge. Dear product owner, I'm working on story 43 and I'm about to go see the SME. Or probably more appropriately is in the daily scrum, as we're looking forward for our plans for the next 24 hours, the team member working on story 43 would just make a casual comment. I'm about to go talk to the SME for 43 and just leave it at that. The product owner has been notified. I'm not talking about a formal email trail, but I'm just talking about making sure the product owner knows we're talking to the SMEs. So the product owner has the chance to say, yes, Betty is the appropriate person to be going talking to. You have my support, you have my blessing. And probably inferred in that is, I'm going to check out the story card when you come back from talking to Betty and make sure that I have total agreement with everything that you and Betty discussed when you were working on the story card for story 43. 
Probably more appropriately is this concept of managing the SMEs and trusting the SMEs. And I think that's really all part and parcel of my last comment is the SMEs have competing priorities and requirements. They're not part of the team. And when I say that, of the direct scrum team. They are implied members of the product team and they are definitely part of the organizational team and those are two important characteristics we have to assume we have to believe that the information we're going to get from the SMEs as part of working on a scrum as part of talking about a story definition, getting that, that 10 minute conversation to better understand a story that is being part of the overall product, the eventual results from this project are going to be implemented into and supporting of their business area and they're probably going to be users of it. So we have to assume that everything they're going to tell us during those 10 conversations is absolutely consistent with in support of the product vision. So if you can think back to the product vision that we talked about in a very early introductory nugget in this series, the product vision lays out where we're going to be in 6, 8, 10, 18 months time when this overall project is done. And we have to assume and expect that our SMEs are going to act consistent with the product vision. Because they're part of the overall product team, they're part of the overall organizational team, and let's face it, we're all going to be more successful when this project slash product is implemented and the organization continues to make money and we continue to get employment and a weekly paycheck. So again, we have to trust them to a large extent, but we also have to recognize that they are not directly engaged in the scrum, so therefore they may not be as scrum wise as we are and and this is a huge and is and this is not unique to scrumness this is unique to all IT project based things is they may have other needs priorities and requirements that are not in the product vision but they think they can slip in and to me, that's the biggest concern, that's the biggest issue of working with SMEs because they are not directly engaged. They're not 100%. They're probably not 50%. They're probably in the 10% range engaged in this particular project in Scrum. If they have other needs, there is an absolute propensity for them to say, I know we're only talking about inventory validation, but if I can just twist the imagination a little bit, so therefore there is a concern, there is a need for managing and trusting the SMEs. And overall, that's why my expectation is when the team member goes off to see Betty about story 43, the product owner is gonna take a peek at the story card when it comes back have a quick talk to the team member and says, what did you learn from this me to make sure that the competing priorities and requirements are not overriding the immediate 10 minute conversation about story 43. Absolute walking the fine line for the team members, for the scrum master and the product owner. SMEs are critical. We're not going to get our project completed successfully without them, but we have to have a grain of salt, if I can say that, for managing and trusting the SMEs to make sure that they're working absolutely in a scrum-like fashion and that they are curbing their competing priorities and requirements, focusing only on the 10% directly related to this project, to this 10-minute conversation on Story 43. And again, educate, 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 make sure the SMEs understand what Scrum is, understand the SMEs understand how to work in a Scrum-like world. 
And now our role as Scrum Masters in working with the business organization, specific our role as Scrum Masters in removing the roadblocks. And all I can say is care, good relationships, being politically sensitive, As much as I, I personally do not like office politics, as a scrum master, I need to be aware of office politics because a lot of the roadblocks that I have to deal with are not project-based. A lot of the roadblocks I have to deal with are SMEs not available. Organizational resistance and dot, 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 dot. A lot of the roadblocks are not under my direct ability to influence. And as a scrum master, I typically am not able to directly control them. So I am at the mercy of others in the org. And what's gonna happen if I, as a scrum master, am going to someone in the organization who is an opponent to remove a roadblock? probably not a lot of support. So therefore, again, just don't need to spend a lot of time on this. I think that this spells itself out. We're, we're all aware of, we're all in tune to the issues around Scrum adoption and Scrum support in the organization. I just wanted to really call it out that as a Scrum master, we need to be aware of our need, our, our requirements, our reliance on our good relations and ships and our political sensitivity to remove the roadblocks that are not project based, typically not able to directly control, but it's in our job to remove the roadblocks or escalate them to management, escalate them to product owner, escalate them to business owner when it's not within our ability to influence the removal of the roadblocks. And now probably the most interesting of all relationships that Scrum projects need to be aware of is how to deal with the traditional IT. And I believe this one is the most interesting because we're all part of the same org. And we probably all have the same manager. Definitely have the same director. And up through the organizational chart. So recognizing that we're all in this together, we all report to the same managers and the same directors, one would assume there should be no conflict. One would assume that everybody in IT is absolutely going to be support of the scrum masters and the people working on scrum projects. Unfortunately, at least my humble experience is that's not often the case. We have a lot of traditional that are roles that are threatened by Scrum and they're threatened by Scrum because they don't know where they fit. So let's talk about the fit. Where do PMs fit into Scrum? And I unfortunately have to say PMs don't fit. Traditional project management, as defined for the last hundreds of years and as specifically defined for the last 30 years for IT, really doesn't fit into Scrum. The concept of doing big scope, big schedule, big budget definition is not Scrum-like. We know Scrum is we have a mandate to continue for X sprints X releases X months. We have an expectation to deliver something that looks somewhat like the vision, but that it is not as well defined. And I use well defined with a, a bit of sarcasm. It's not as well defined as the overall scope for a traditional project. So PMs literally don't fit into Scrum. Are PMs a natural evolution to a Scrum master? Not necessarily. PMs are used to having power and authority. 
Scrum masters, as we've discussed, do not have power and authority. They're simply there to support the team, to remove the roadblocks, and to ensure the project is delivered in a Scrum-like fashion. So probably our biggest issue with traditional IT is where do the PMs fit? And unfortunately, being a, an ex-PM myself, the statement is you have to evolve or find another role. If your organization goes purely Scrum, PMs have to evolve and find a new role because there is no role for PMs in Scrum. The rest of these people, the DBAs, the architects, the BAs, there is a fit. There is an absolute fit. Scrum does not replace anything IT does. We still do analysis. We still do design. We still do development. We still do testing. We still do uh, manuals. We still do training, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, there is an absolute need for DBAs, architects, and BAs in Scrum. The big difference is the role for a DBA, an architect, a BA in Scrum is they're part-time DBAs, they're part-time architects, they're part-time BAs, and they are also part-time analysis, they are part-time designers, they are part-time developers, they are part-time testers, they are part-time procedure manual writers, they are part-time trainers, etc, etc, etc. But when we discussed, describe our Scrum team, we have people who are better at one role than another. So if we have a DBA as part of our Scrum team, Obviously, every story that involves a database, and let's face it, there's not going to be a lot of stories that don't touch the database in one form or another, but all of the stories that touch the database, we probably want our DBA team member to look at, to validate, and there will be stories related to the database that are 100% DBA. We need to create a new table. We need to create a new index. We need to do any or other of hundreds of DBA type activities. And we need a DBA wise resource on our Scrum team. The difference is we do this iteratively. No longer is the DBA going to spend weeks or months doing normalization and full database schema definition and, and, and. We're going to expect our DBA to do a little bit of normalization, normalization for the three extra data fields that are required to support this story. But the DBAs fit, and I'm not going to go through the same level of detail because I think your imagination can easily say the same applies to the architect. We need to do architecture work on every story and we need our architects to be prepared to do a little bit of analysis design development. Again, there will be stories that are 100% architecture and there will be stories that are 5% architecture and BAs, etc, etc, etc. So there's an absolute role for these people and my experience is the DBAs, the architects, the BAs are much, much happier in a scrum role. And that may seem counterintuitive. They've worked hard. They've become the recognized expert in the organization as the DBA or the architect. Isn't it demeaning for them to become, well, you're the person with more DBA smarts in a scrum team than the rest of the team members, but you're just one of a team? Yes. If you want to look at it from a pure quote unquote rank and authority, it may seem as a demotion, but the reason they're much happier in these scrum roles is they see more variety and they see results. And I think that's the key. As a DBA, in a traditional world, all the DBA is sits back at their desk doing normalization, doing indexing, doing tables. They never step out of their desk. They never get that business interaction. They never actually get to see a screen working. They never get to see the end results. In Scrum, they see the results. 
they get to do all of the things they're, they're, they're paid for, their knowledge as a DBA, and they get to see the results. So again, my expectation is properly managed, probably all but the poor old PMs. The PMs need to evolve, but everybody else in traditional IT, properly managed, absolutely will be ecstatic to work in a Scrum environment. Some of the other resistance you're going to get from the business areas related to making Scrum work is we have areas that absolutely need traditional environment because of their uh, legislative requirements, because of the rules, because of the process, because of any of hundreds of, I'm going to say, fabricated reasons. There will be people, business areas that say, Scrum isn't going to work. We need to follow traditional development. My answer is, OK, go ahead. Do it your way. We do not have to make an organization 100% Scrum on day one or day five or day 15. It's absolutely OK to say, we'll continue to do traditional development and evolve it. And my expectation is over time, these people, the opponents to Scrum, saying I can't go Scrum because of any of these reasons, are going to begin to see the success of the other Scrum projects and will change. And I think that's a good thing. And literally, if there are still parts of the business that say we will never go Scrum, fine, let them be it. There will be people who say I need absolute traditional project management. I need to have scope. I need to have assurances on time and on dollars. And again, the answer is, OK, go ahead. Do it your way. I believe they will evolve. I believe they will change. And therefore, again, don't stress about the areas that are non-scrum. I believe they will come across once they see the success of all of the work that we're doing in our scrum projects. There are a few areas that are harder and I will stress harder to make Scrum. And that's package implementation. If you're going out and buying a package and the package needs to be implemented all at once, how do we implement a package all at once that doesn't have a lot of modules and be Scrum-like? If we're dealing with outside vendors that are fixed price, here's the requirements. I'm going to take six months, develop all your requirements, and give you the software in one package. Again, that's going to be much harder to work in a Scrum Lite area. So there will be instances where traditional development, traditional PM may still apply. And some of these may simply never go away because of the nature of the business, the nature of the engagement, the nature of our, our reliance on externals to support IT in our organization. So if you're looking for a place for those PMs that just don't want to become Scrum-like, there is most likely an area of package implementation outside vendors where we probably need to provide support, expect a bit of the traditional work. OK, fine. We don't have to be all Scrum, but my expectation is as the organization sees more benefits from Scrum, we will look for ways to make these more Scrum-like. And that's the beauty of Scrum, is we can become Scrum-like. We do not have to have 100% Scrum functionality, but we can become more iterative, more participatory, more evolutionary, even when dealing with package implementation and outside vendors. And we do that by adjusting our expectations and our contracts. Probably the one aspect of non-Scrum areas that I've seen the most is ongoing management reporting. Management is saying, yes, <clears throat> we're very happy that you're Scrum-like. We're very happy that you can do everything that's Scrum, but I still need some degree of assurances that in 14 months after I spent $250,000, I have some results. So again, my expectation is we probably need to do a little bit of traditional reporting to give senior management, the C-suite of people, the CIO, the CEO, the CXO, some degree of 
confidence that the scrum thing is working, at least in the earlier stages, that I would believe, again, that we need to have some degree of traditional reporting to support some of these non-scrum areas as part of the evolution. And then as the C-suite become more confident in our scrum approaches, they will probably back off and relax some of the traditional approaches. But again, don't expect to be 100% scrum on day zero. Expect to have some degree of evolution. And I've left the biggest area of concern for Scrum to the very last because it is also the very easiest to deal with. A lot of organizations that have compliance and certification in, in place, whether you're ISO, CMMI, ITIL, COBIT, and dot, 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 dot compliance, a lot of the auditors, et cetera, et cetera, are going to say, I don't know that we can continue to support Scrum because it doesn't give us all of the evidence needed to support the audits, doesn't give us all of the evidence to ensure that we still get our ISO, our CMMI, our ITIL, et cetera, et cetera, certification. I think we're going to have to stop Scrum. I think Scrum is a wonderful thing. I really support Scrum as an auditor, but it doesn't give me the evidence that I need to ensure that the banner stays on the side of the building and that is all false. There is nothing in Scrum that prevents us from maintaining 100% of all of the compliance and certification that we have in place today. To me, the secret is inviting in the auditors and get it pre-approved. Audit is concerned. Audit is looking for evidence. Audit is looking for the paperwork. Literally, audit is looking for the checklist that they can go tick, 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 and say, there is my evidence that I need to support my certification. So be creative, invite in the auditors at the beginning of your Scrum engagement, tell the auditors what you're going to do, get pre-approved, and look for creative solutions. I had an example of, I've, and it's not a personal example, but I read it in a textbook where one Scrum auditor or one auditor came into a Scrum project and said, I really like everything you're doing. I think it's super, but I need evidence of the stories. I need to be able to put something in a filing cabinet to show that the stories are complete. So the team said, fine, we'll photocopy. As each story is completed, they put the story card in the photocopier, they photocopy the front side that shows here's the need, and they photocopy the back side that here's all of the tick boxes. And they photocopy it and they provide the evidence that the auditors need. So look for creative solutions, find ways to support it. Something maybe as simple as photocopying a story card, taking still pictures of the burn up, the burn down charts and putting them in, in the audit file. But look for creative solutions. I believe key is build the compliance checklist. We talked about having our checklist on the back of our story card for definition of done. Do a similar lightweight checklist that shows everything we need to support the CSO, the CSO, the ISO, CMMI, et cetera, et cetera, compliance. Develop the checklist, invite the auditors in, get pre-approval, and then ensure as the scrum master that the team does it. And again, I think we're well on the way for keeping our compliance and our certification and keeping our auditors happy. Couple of last comments. As much as I have throughout this entire series said, we do not need specialized Scrum software. Steve believes in story cards and manual charts on the wall. Steve absolutely still believes in all of that. But often, if your organization is a compliance-based organization, Scrum software may well be the answer because the Scrum, Scrum software is gonna give us that evidence. At the end of each sprint, do a backup of the data that's in our Scrum software, archive it to an archive server somewhere. And again, we have the evidence with the pre-approval from the auditors to get the job done. And if all else fails, find an expert, find an ISO scrum expert, 
bring in that ISO Scrum expert, have that ISO Scrum expert meet with your audit team, and that ISO Scrum expert can prove to, can validate, can support, can cajole your auditors that says there are hundreds of organizations in the world that are 100% Scrum that still have their ISO or the CMMI or their, or their, or their certification. So again, five to 10 days of that industry expert who is both an industry expert in their area of certification and in Scrum can absolutely move forward with great strides to convincing your auditors that Scrum is certifiable. This nugget was focused on team and business dynamic, basically making Scrum work. We talked about understanding the business structure, whether we have supporters or opponents and the need to expect visitors and the need to educate the organization on the way of Scrum to get the buy-in and the support. Spent considerable time talking about how to work with SMEs. SMEs are a very interesting critical component to be in Scrum. They have the knowledge, but they're not part of the team. So as a scrum proponents, we need to be aware of the fact that sometimes the SMEs are going to have different priorities and needs than specific to our sprint and our story. And we need to be prepared to work with the product owner to make sure that all of the information we're getting from the SMEs is consistent with our immediate scrum-like 10-minute conversation needs and that we're not moving into a larger more traditional requirements dump list. Talked about the Scrum Master and the roadblocks. The Scrum Master needs to be political and needs to work within the confines of the organization. Talked at great lengths about how to fit traditional IT in and the answer is it fits in fine. The DBAs the architects, the BAs, the et cetera, et cetera, absolutely can find a very positive contributing role in a Scrum project and actually become much more active and much more participatory in delivery of IT throughout the organization if appropriately managed and developed. We talked about that there will be some areas of resistance, Areas that think they can't go Scrum, areas that say, oh, I'm inter in implementing a big package, it doesn't support Scrum, or I'm working with a, a vendor who doesn't support Scrum. There will be Scrum areas, and my answer is fine. Let them be non-Scrum-like. I expect after two or three years of continuing to struggle in their traditional ways, they're going to find ways to become more Scrum-like. And finally, we talked about the biggest impediment that most organizations put out to Scrum is, I have compliance. I'm ISO, I'm CMM, I'm, I'm ITIL certified. I don't believe I can maintain my certification using Scrum. The answer is, you can. There's all kinds of creative ways to ensure that Scrum evidence supports your certification. Involve the auditors early and bring in an expert if needed. But you can absolutely be Scrum and still be certified. This concludes our nugget on team and business dynamics. I hope this module was informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.